for being here with us this morning. I know that it is. What's that? (coughs) Sean is frozen. No, the enemy is hard at work this morning already. Uh, Sean has had problems connecting all morning. So we'll bear with him while he sorts out his internet issues. Can everybody hear and see me okay so that we can isolate the issue if it's my network or if it's Sean's? If I can get some feedback from you guys. So before I get started, I am going to go over what uh, a contest I have coming up is. So I'm I am launching a contest. Oh, here's Sean trying to connect again. Sean? All right. So I have a contest that I'm going to launch that is going to promote our social media platform. Our social platform, what I will do is Humble Lamb is sending me a new Bible for their new upcoming release. And I'm going to give this new Bible away as a part of this social platform promotion. And in a nutshell, it's very simple. The most folks that you send that becomes a member on our platform, it can, they can sign up for whatever. They just need to register on the social platform and create a profile. But the most people that is sent by the one person um, at the end of the 30 days will win that Humble Lamb Bible. I feel like that's a pretty simple contest. And should, you know, it's for me, it's about getting the word out there because as we grow our community, it's, it's important that we all congregate in a safe place. So again, just to kind of recap the way to work is, you know, I'm sure every one of you guys on the stream right now are already members on our social platform. You're there. I see interacting every day. So it goes, uh, you know, it's a simple contest. Whichever person refers the most new members will win that Humble M Bible at the end of the 30 days. And what I'll do is I'll put in a, a, an option in the sign-up process that allows them to say who, was ref, you know, who referred you. But also, everybody on our platform sees the new members show up because it ends up in the timeline with them creating their profile and their thumbnail. So if you guys see someone that you referred, we'll just keep track of that. But this should be fun. This should be fun. Um, Anybody have any questions on that? Anybody? Uh, You know, in a nutshell, I don't need another Humble Lamb Bible. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I got seven of them. So I'm good on Humble Lamb Bibles. But I think everybody could use one because they're by far, in my eyes, the, the, you know, grade A. Now, let me see what's going on with Sean. I think Sean was having um, some issues. Let's check my text messages. All right, so everybody can hear me. So Russ White says, what's a humble lamb Bible? Oh, brother, let me tell you what. These Bibles are absolutely incredible. They are by far the most beautiful Bible you will ever put your hands on. They are just absolutely gorgeous in the way they are laid out. They make a few versions Um, this one here, another beautiful Bible, but the way the pages are laid out is absolutely incredible. It's, these are just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous books. And, you know, for folks that have been Bible people for quite some time, folks, you'll recognize the difference between 
your, you know, your standard uh, Bible, and then ones that have had a lot more attention to detail. And that's one thing I love about the Humble Lamb Bibles is their attention to detail is immaculate. Every little thing, the fonts, the quality of the pages, the leather, it's, it's just, if, if you like a nice Bible, this will interest you. And you can look on their website at their Bibles. It's humblelamb.com. And matter of fact, on our core website, uh, Two Witnesses Live, we have a blog post that all the members have a discount code where they can utilize for that. So let me confirm that everybody can hear me okay because Sean is struggling to connect with us. Let me see what he's saying. He is rebooting his computer. Just one second. He's rebooting his computer. So worst case, I'll, he'll have him just uh, connect with his phone. Yeah, so, yeah, there's uh, several, several different colors of uh, the Humble Lamb. You know, like, my one that I carry with me everywhere, this is, like, my main go-to one that, you know, when I'm at church, um, I do all my notes and writing in this one. This is their shepherd. Their shepherd's a little bigger. Um, then their history, uh, NSA, N. I uh, forget, NSAB version. This is also an awesome, awesome version. It's a little smaller, but the attention to detail with the pages and the fonts is just incredible. The pages and the illustration and the wording is just absolutely incredible with these. It's You, you feel something special, at least I do. I feel something special holding these Humble Lamb Bibles. Um, they are, I have fallen in love with them. I've gone through pretty much and got every color just because I love them. Even the pink one. My wife laughs at me. I'm like, I'm good with pink. It's, um, this is one of the lions. But they are incredible. And again, if, you know, if you're not a hard copy Bible person, this won't be for you. Some people prefer, you know, using a Bible app or, you know, the computer to pull their scripture and that's fine. No biggie. But if you like a, a nice Bible, it is hands down incredible. Show this side picture. Oh, the side picture. Yeah. So all of these Bibles on the side will have a beautiful image set up on it um they're just the attention to detail is just incredible that's just for me i'm one of those folks that really really enjoy um the fine details of certain things whether it be bibles or watches or stuff of that nature um I've kind of let go of the whole uh, watch thing. I, I went through a phase in my life where I like nice watches, but it's more that's more materialistic stuff that um, I've really lost interest in uh, over the last few years. It was uh, something, you know, it, it, at a certain point in your life, you know, when you're making decent money and you're not really connected with Christ, it seems that your focus is on collecting uh, material wealth. And I went through that phase. Matter of fact, I was in that phase from the age of 20 to the age of 45. So I spent a long time um, completely thinking I was good, you know, going to church every Sunday and spending two hours with the Lord. But now that I reflect back on it, I definitely wasn't good. I definitely wasn't. It, you know, it's it's hard to put into words, but once you've made that transition where you become one with the spirit and you invite him into you and he's a part of your daily life, you know, and I've made this comparison before. It's like if you're in a marriage with your partner, you speak with your partner several times a day. 
you know, you wake up and you talk, you have breakfast together, you know, you talk after lunch, you talk before you go to work, you maybe even talk while you're at work, and then when you get home, you spend more time together. That is how my relationship with Christ has been since uh, 2020. And it, it changes you. It does. I will say that at this point in my life, uh, I experience the most joy and content and patience and happiness than I ever have. Even at the point where my income is a fraction of what it used to be. You know, I probably make 10% of what I did for the majority of my life in my photography career. And it, 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 you come to realize that that stuff doesn't matter. You know, it's, I understand that it's important that the bills are paid so that you don't stress about that so you can keep your family fed. But beyond that, uh, it's artificial happiness is what I've found. You know, I, I know lots of very wealthy people that are very miserable. And the key to happiness is that relationship with Christ. Hands down, I know it for a fact. All right, let's check on Sean. I think he's still struggling. He needs the link. So how is everybody doing today? Everybody doing good? Kind of interested to see how this all plays out today. What's your guys' thoughts? Do you think anything is actually going to happen? Or... Is it a big nothing burger and everybody has hyping it up? You know, I'm on the fence. For me, I think prophetically it absolutely means something. I have felt the shift spiritually over the last few days. So I think it marks the beginning of something. Whether that means anything happens today, I don't know. But I think we are entering in a new phase of prophecy. I think we are going to see a change and we're going to experience events over the coming months that will clearly illustrate where we are. Now, that doesn't mean that the powers that be and their planned shenanigans will not do something. So, time will tell. Time will tell. But to confirm, you guys, I don't think uh, anyone answered me. You guys can hear and see me okay? Because Sean's having problems with his internet. Um... So if you guys can confirm that your connection uh, with my server is good, then I know that the issue lies on his end. And I will see if he can sort it out somehow. Uh, worst case, Sean, he can just dial in with his phone. Worst case, he can just dial in with his phone. Yes, you can hear and see me. Okay, everything's good. <sighs> you know, sometimes these these tech things happen. I think this is, you know, the enemy really plays a big role in technology. As you've heard me talk about before, you know, the worldwide net, that was founded on the principles of Satan. You know, the WWW is the 666. And I'm not sure for those of you who remember, a week or two ago, I was streaming on my solo channel. I was streaming out of my laptop. And the whole, you know, the whole stream went dead. You know, we lost feed the whole nine yards. What happened was my computer shut down. But it didn't only just shut down. The logic board went up in smoke. It, uh, I can't, and we, you know, the folks at the Apple store, they can't explain it either. Um, they, they said that it looks like uh, something was spilled in it. Uh, there was signs of moisture, which was 100% not the case because the laptop was sitting right here and I was streaming and it stopped working. Um so it's, it's crazy to see how the enemy works. He tries to prevent these messages from getting out. We all know this. We witness it on a regular basis. 
Luckily, I had a backup laptop and backup computers. Oh, here we go. Here's Sean. Oh, there we go, Sean. Sean, you're there. <laughs> you made it. All right. Can well, that me? was... Yeah, we can hear you. The enemy was fighting with you, brother. Well, it was catastrophic uh, failure of my internet. And then oh. I couldn't reboot the uh, mini, mini thing, Mac Mini or whatever. So, eh, it happens. Well, you know, the I was just telling the group that the internet is actually essentially the foundation of Satan. Um, it was formed by CERN. The for the longest time, the www was the prefix at the beginning of every website, which is six six six. And even though it has done a lot of good connecting um, everybody together, the body of Christ. It also has done catastrophic things for families and people and and their yeah. ability to, to sin on demand. So it is a double-edged sword. But it seems it is a tool that the enemy can take advantage of from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But well, I mean, we will we tell him to flee. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, our job is to redeem uh, technology for Christ and and we do that in so many other areas I mean there's we we've been successful in that area and we can we can do it again it's um it's amazing you know people that would never have access to the um, the word they have access to it uh, people that would have no access to any sort of um, church service they have access to it yeah and so i, I you know I, I understand its origins are are less than less than good but at the same time i have to say i'm i'm, I'm not one to write it off just yet because look at look at what we're able to do here today absolutely i agree a hundred percent you're right if 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 we did not have this technology this entire community that we have built would not be connected. Yeah. So, so, so what is God that? has 17, definitely 18,000 people, you know, um, on YouTube, uh, 17, 18,000 people on Facebook, uh, about 10,000 people on Twitter, uh, three or 4,000 people. And then, yeah, um, I, I'm sure there's other sources, but it's growing. That's great. I think that's uh, I think that's incredible. I, I'm I'm excited about that, and um, obviously my channel, the True Word Faith for Life channel, is tiny. It's brand new. It's and, growing. Uh, yeah, little by little, and uh, Thank, so, you know yeah. things take time, brother. You know our channel is only four months old. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing how it happens. You know, people are. Uh, I don't know. I think. I think there are lots of times people, they feel lost, you know, and they connect to the internet, they connect to YouTube. Uh, somebody uh, sent me a message the other day telling me about how they connected. And I thought, wow, that's, what do you I mean? didn't even know. Um, they sent me a message. This person sent me a message and was telling me about this person. Somebody listened to it. Uh, they didn't really know this person very well. And, uh, so they, uh, it, there was this whole big, there's like five people before this person ever got to see, uh, my channel. Huh. And you could have, you could have never guessed in a million years that that would ever happen because honestly, I mean, it, it was a crazy story. It was a really crazy story. Yeah. So, yeah. What you going to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That's one reason, you know, folks often ask me, why am I making memes? Because I get laughed at it quite a bit for making memes. But mm -hmm. I feel like the memes 
um, make people aware of certain things. And yeah. with the memes, uh, I also brand our channel's logo and ability to get on our channel with those memes. And people are going to recirculate those memes all over the world. So yeah. that's it's just another uh, channel growth. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just crazy. another tactic for channel growth. So what do you yeah, have for us today, know, brother? I I'm don't sorry. Even know how any of that, I don't even know how any of that stuff works, to be honest. I'm just, uh, what do you mean? I'm along for the ride. And any of that channel growth and the memes do this and this does that. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm along for the ride. So today, well, fear and forgiveness, true communion with God. And um, I've been excited about this. Now, there was a listener who uh, she's an amazing listener and supporter of the True Witnesses. Um, and she uh, she shared with me an experience she had. And I thought, wow, I love that. It was a really powerful thing. And uh, I was moved by it. And I was already writing a message for today. And what she was moved by actually... It, it was crazy. It was so in alignment with what I was talking about. So I thought, wow, that's that's kind of a, a, a cool word from the Lord. And uh, so anyway, so understanding the true meaning of fear and forgiveness and the true purpose and meaning behind observing communion or the Lord's Supper. And really what I want to talk about, part of that is what we've long misunderstood uh, about fear and forgiveness and what we've long misunderstood about communion and how to correct it. I mean, it's great to point out a problem, but in, unless you can correct it, um, you're just kind of complaining, you know? And so I like to present solutions, uh, whatever, whatever I'm going to get involved in. I, if I'm going to get involved in it, I want to be a bringer of solutions. So, unfortunately, we have the solution in the word of God. So, um, it, it really, communion is one of those ordinances, one of those commands that, that we have, we've misunderstood it for a long time. And, uh, I want to correct that. And I had to correct it in myself for, you know, some time back. I, and it really is a means of, of expressing our love and obedience to God and, and really in a powerful and obedient way. So first, a few words about fear. Now, we're to rebuke fear. We're to, to fear. And we're to receive forgiveness. Rebuke, reject fear and receive forgiveness. Forgiveness in Christ and fear from the enemy. Now, one of the great friends of the show, I was just mentioning to you, um, of our show, and you know her very well, a, a deeply faithful lady and an amazing, amazing um, she loves Jesus. And, um, and I love that. I love being around people who love Jesus. And so she shared something with me that her pastor, um, ironically, same day, this, this all occurred within just a few hours while I'm writing this message, or, or I had written most of this message, all of these events took place. And so he shared her pastor shared uh, yesterday with the congregation that 85% of what people worry about never happens. Have you been there? I mean, we worry about stuff and 85% of it never happens. Now, in my counseling practice, I refer to uh, something similar to that as pre-emoting. Pre that, you're, I mean, you're spot on with that, man. I, it's, I was just thinking about that when you were saying that. I'm like, you're so right. Almost uh, everything that you worry and stress over never comes to fruition. And yeah. th the reality of it is, is that is the enemy preying on your emotions and yeah. you living in fear instead of putting your trust fully in Christ. But man, that's, you're spot on with that. I just I had to interrupt. Ah, I appreciate it. So, so, and, and people can identify with that. I think all of us have been there where we've been worried about something that we exert no control over. Um, we, we have no way of influencing the situation. Um, of the 15% that actually did have something happen, something negative, a, a whole whopping 7% said it wasn't as bad as they feared and they handled it and they learned something valuable in the process. 
Has this ever been you? Worry doesn't matter when you think about who God is in your life. Um, I'll tell you what else too, and this pastor pointed it out, and I and I actually happened to I happen to have had it um, in my notes. Worry's unhealthy. Um, I you know I I spoke briefly about my term pre emoting, um, where you feel the emotions of that thing you fear, and so you're you're you are in deep on those emotions, and it's and it's you. F- as though it happened or was happening, you're experiencing the negative health effects of it, even though it's not happening. 30% of deaths are stress-related. 19% of the population have an anxiety-related disorder. Everyone is anxious these days. Everybody is. Can you identify with that? Has that ever been you? In 2010 to 2020, I thought this is an interesting statistic that he had and I had. I was one number off. Um, 2010 to 2020, anxiety increased 139% in ages 20 or uh, 18 to 25. An increase of anxiety, 139% in ages 18 to 25. Look, young adults... Young people, they're involved in the cell phone generation. That's what this is now. And honestly, we were just kind of joking about um, how it kind of all went to heck in a handbasket here on my end. The internet went down and the Mac mini, you know, wouldn't made up with the keyboard and the this and the that and the Bluetooth and yada, yada. And then I couldn't get the link to work and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point of it is, Um, We are tied to technology, as you said, about the Internet. Um, You know, it's it we could very easily fall into this humongous trap of this is our world. You know, this this thing right here is our world. Oh, that's my that is my world. My little grandbaby right there. Um, Awesome little human being. His mama and daddy are pretty awesome, too. Anyway, so that being said, there's a tendency in this, you know, modern age, uh, this postmodern age, uh, toward the defense mode over the discover mode. And anxiety disorders, I thought this is an interesting statistic, and anxiety disorders cost the United States economy, just the United States economy, 42 billion with a B, that's 11 zeros, dollars a year. Now, I know a lot of you guys are into the eclipse and, and all that, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm down with that. Um, but how about the eclipse that's happening today? There, there are a lot of people who are really, really fearful about uh, that event. They're fearful about what it means, um, its ramifications, uh, the indications of it. Christians. I'm sad to say, are very fearful. I've seen a lot of Christians that are just really, really nervous about it. Oh, what if the world ends? And you know what? I don't care. Why? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. But first, here is a gospel song that I wrote, um, and it's called What I Forgot to Forget. Now, this is a country gospel song. So I write uh, classic hymns. I'll write, uh, you know, contemporary worship music. And then I like to, I, I love um, blues, bluegrass, and country. So just be thinking like a bluegrassy sort of country uh, to this. And it, remember, it's called What I Forgot to Forget. In the stillness of the night when the shadows start to creep, I feel the weight of burdens that I struggle hard to keep. Memories of mistakes, regrets I can't erase. They whisper in the darkness, trying to steal my grace. Then the chorus, my buddy, um, I mentioned this. This is not part of the song, by the way. Um, My buddy, John Woodall, is recording one of the songs. He's putting one of the songs that I've written to music. And then he's either going to do it as a single or he and I are going to do a duet on it. And I, I'm hoping that he'll do this one too, because I really like his sound. He can, he can, he can really tap into what I'm getting at. So here's the chorus. Um, anyway, I brought him up because he taught me how 
the order is supposed to be. I didn't know any of that. I just I used to write poems and stuff like that, and I knew how they were to go, but I didn't know really the structure of songs. I forgot to forget, but I'm not dead yet. The good Lord's still working on me, but I'm living with fear of what I forgot to forget, holding on to memories that I haven't let go of yet. But I won't be shaken, no, I won't be moved, because God ain't done with me. He's still working on this heart so true. Then the second verse, in the valleys of my soul, where doubts begin to rise, I hear the voice of mercy calling from the sky, saying, Child, don't be afraid, for I'm always near. I'll walk with you through darkness. I'll wipe away the tears. I forgot to forget, but I'm not dead yet. The good Lord still working on me. So I'm living with fear of what I forgot to forget, holding on to memories I haven't let go of yet. But I won't be shaken. No, I won't be moved, because God ain't done with me yet. He's still working on this heart so true. Though storms may rage around me and the night seems long and cold, I'll cling to faith and promise. That's my stories yet untold. For I know that in his timing, he'll make all things brand new. So I'll trust in his unfailing love in everything I do. I forgot to forget, but I'm not dead yet. The good Lord's still working on me. Yes, I'm living with fear of what I forgot to forget, holding on to memories that I haven't let go of yet. But I won't be shaken, no, I won't be moved, because God ain't done with me yet. He's still working on this heart so true. So I'll keep on walking forward with my eyes fixed on the light, knowing that with every step God's leading me through the night. And though fear may try to hold me, I'll stand firm and I'll be bold, for in his hands my future rests and his love will never grow old. So back to the solar eclipse. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope to play it for you uh, at some point soon. Um, so back to the solar eclipse. Why? Why don't I fear some eclipse in the solar system? Why? I'll tell you why. Because my God created this solar system. He thought it up. He created it. He spoke it into existence. Every little thing. My God did Amen. That. Amen. So Man, I'm a, a follower of the way. And, and it's the only way. Being a follower of the way is the only way. And my God did all that. Why do I need to fear something that happens in the, in the skies, in the space? I don't fear space junk. I don't fear stuff. Now, look, I don't want to litter the, the, the outer space. That seems stupid. I don't want to litter the earth here. And I don't want to litter the air. I don't want to litter the water. And I don't want to litter the outer space. I mean, we should be good stewards of what God gave us to enjoy our, our home place for now. Just like we should be good stewards of the, um, what did that dear uh, believer, what does she call it? It's almost like a, a human wetsuit, like a spiritual wetsuit. Yeah. And we're in that wetsuit. Our bodies the, is the wetsuit. Um, Tahani, amazing. I never heard it put that way. And so. Well, there's, you know, God, there has been, there has been several people that in their NDEs, when they came back, said it was the worst feeling they ever had. When they left and left their body, it was the most amount of joy and bliss they ever experienced. But when they were put back in their body, it felt completely um, unnatural. And it took them weeks to get yeah. used to being back in the body. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, coming back to the human body uh, would be, especially me, uh, such a letdown, you know, because our heavenly bodies are going to be made perfect, painless, fearless. There's be nothing to fear. Uh, no, no pain, no sorrow, no tears, no aches. None of that. It's just amazing. What are you going to do? Play a little tune to my... Uh, yeah, I thought home. you were going to sing. Yeah, you're going to sing. I was going <laughs> to... So, um, I'm teasing. But that would yeah, be Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do sing it. Uh, I do sing it to my own little melody, but uh, but um, I'm I'm excited to see what he might do with it. And if he doesn't, I have some other friends that are um, Nashville uh, recording artists. So maybe you know we'll see. Anyway, well, actually, but it's not about when you that. when you come da- when you come down here and you're with me in person, maybe we can do that just to to yeah. to have fun. And if it works out, it works out. If not, at least some folks to get a few laughs. That's awesome. Yeah, you bet. 
You bet, because I am funny looking. So, so I don't fear. I don't fear the the things that happen in the solar system. I don't fear. You might say you're this ultra prepared guy and this guy with all kinds of life and death combat, not combat per se, but life and death. You know, I live or you live, but it can't be both. And um, and having lived through those things, and having almost died through those things, you might think, well, you know, you you. There, you've lived through a lot of stuff that you should fear. And I, I don't mean to say that I, I don't have any elements of fear. Certainly, uh, we're human. We, we live in a human skin and a, and a human structure. And because of the fall, we, you know, we're not living in, in the manner that we were intended to live. And right. so, uh, but this, this solar eclipse, I, I have no fear at all. I have none whatsoever. So, so what does God say? What does God say about fear? Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Timothy 1.7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power, love, and discipline. Psalm 23, 4, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Joshua 1, 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do not be anxious. This is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That means that we are to communicate with God. We are to have communion with God. We are to be connected with God. And we are to connect with Him and ask Him, Please help me with my fears. And you know what we're supposed to do? Before we present those requests that we have to God, we're to give thanks to him. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Right? We're honoring him. In the Lord's Prayer, the example that he gave us, he gave us a structure. And what we're to do is acknowledge that when we begin our prayer, we're to acknowledge who and what he is. He's the creator of all. And so... Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to say this. The headline here is that these kind of fears remind us that fear isn't from God, but rather it's a hindrance to our faith and and trust in him. Instead of caving to fear, I encourage you to rely on God's strength, rely on his promises and his presence to overcome challenges and uncertainties in your life. We all have challenges and uncertainties in our lives. I have massive challenges and uncertainties in my life. I've got at least three major surgeries coming up, and I'm going to tell you, that could go either way but it will go either way by the will of God. Uh, A surgeon's mistake can't kill me, and no matter the greatest surgeon in the world operating flawlessly can't save my life. It's up to God. By seeking God's peace and placing our trust in Him, we rebuke fear and we walk in faith and confidence. Now, I told you I was going to talk about communion. I alluded to it just a tiny bit, but uh, and and I look, I didn't know this. I did not know this yesterday when Tahani and I were talking. It was before church. And so I didn't know we were going to have communion. If I knew, I forgot. I had no memory of that. What did we have yesterday? Communion. And so the ordinance of communion, known to some as the Lord's Supper, um, or, for, or for others, depending on what faith uh, tradition you're in, you could refer to it as the Eucharist. And a Eucharist minister in that in that um, in those traditions are the ones that they they hand out the bread and the wine and and all of that. They you know they do the structure of it, the nuts and bolts of it. And uh, so it finds its origin in the Last Supper, and that was a pivotal event in the life of Jesus Christ, and one of the most significant events in our lives, if we observe it 
properly. It's, de it's described in the New Testament um, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? So that's the New Testament starts with Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. Um, as well as in the writings of the Apostle Paul, or Shaul, um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. During the Last Supper, Jesus, Yeshua Hamashiach, shared a meal with his disciples on the night before his uh, crucifixion. Now, I rarely will read from this um, particular uh, translation, but I'm going to read from it because it perfectly illustrates those things that maybe a brand new Christian or somebody curious about faith in Christ might struggle with understanding, well, what does this mean? It seems like there's words missing. So I'm going to give you, with emphasis, the word that is implied, which we know, but if you're new to all this, um, what you'll, you'll know when it's that word that's not in Scripture but implied. For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that which the Lord Jesus on, that, on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is, or represents, my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Remember, he did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, to complete it, to perfect it, ratified and established in my blood, to do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. But a person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ. And only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ eats and drinks a judgment upon himself if he does not recognize the body of Christ that careless and unworthy participation is the reason why many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep which means death but if we evaluated and judged ourselves honestly recognizing recognizing our shortcomings and correcting our behavior our hurts habits and hang, our hang-ups our sins we would not be judged but when we fall short and are judged by the Lord we are disciplined by undergoing his correction so that we will not be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world so then my brothers and sisters when you come together to eat the Lord's Supper wait for another and see to it that no one is left out if anyone is too hungry to wait let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment on yourselves about the remaining matters of which I was informed I will take care of them when I come now this in part for context here uh, Paul the Apostle Paul was writing to the church saying hey this is you know they're learning stuff and some people were coming in and scarfing up all the bread and drinking up all the wine you know that and they and some were genuinely authentically hungry and uh, they would just scarf up the wine. They, they, they weren't being uh, patient. And so he said, eat at home. Um, and also that was the job of what we would call modern day, we would call the deacons, to make sure people had food. So Jesus instructed his disciples to do this in remembrance of him. And by doing that, he instituted the practice of communion. Now, I, I want you to understand, it doesn't have to be once a quarter, doesn't have to be once every six months, doesn't have to be once a year. Some churches only observe it once a year. Some do it every Sunday. It doesn't even have to be in a church, doesn't even have to be administered by a pastor. You can have communion in your home. But what does this act symbolize? It symbolizes the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It symbolizes his body broken 
for you and for me. His blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, your sins, and mine. And it serves as a tangible reminder of Christ's great sacrifice on behalf, on our be He did this for us. And he did it as a means of spiritual nourishment for believers. So since that momentous occasion, Christ's followers have continued to observe communion as a central aspect of our faith. Or Can I ask a question? Be. Yeah, yeah, fire it at me. Um, so in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and actually John, all of them uh, essentially go over the Last Supper with him in their own words. But they, yep. all, they all say that, For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Because he, he makes that statement in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which that, verse are you on? Um, right now, I'm in Luke uh, 22, um, 2214. It's, he's, it's at the Lord's Supper, Supper. He says, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So in Luke 14, he says, when the hour had come... He sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of okay. God. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, so what that is, is, is this is his last meal. Right. Right, because what's going to happen to him? He's going to be tortured. First of all, he's going to be tried illegally multiple times. And then he's going to be tortured, almost beaten to death, and uh, 39 won from death. So he had the lashes that actually tore the skin completely off of his back, all the way to the bone, took chips of, of his bone. Yeah. So he knew he wasn't going to eat or drink again until he is with the Father. So that means he had to die before being able to eat again. So last meal here on earth of bread and wine. And of course, you know, um, there's a lot to be thought about there, knowing this is the last meal you're ever going to eat on earth. This is the last time you're ever going to hang with these boys that you've been hanging with. Um, and these ladies, I mean, he had a massive, massive following of people. We, we forget how massive it was. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have to study, you know, a little bit extra biblical, uh, historical, writings to understand what a massive this is why it was so scary for for the power brokers because they you know they were afraid uh, that he was going to take away their power and their influence and to to a great degree their wealth um and i would even say that he was going to find out he he would find them out and um as if they could ever stop him but but the point is is that this was going to be the last food or drink that he had to eat before he drinks again and eats again. Um, and what did they do? Remember what happened later on after he reappears to them? Uh, he had breakfast you know, with them, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so he's telling them, hey, this is it. This is the last one. And then uh, we're going to have another one. So they had to have some faith. And it was scary for them. It was a scary time. It had been scary for us. If we were there, right, we would have gotten out our firearms and, and, and busted some caps in some folks and said, oh, no, you don't. You're not killing my king. You're not killing my best friend. You're not killing my master. There's no way in this world. You, you're you going to do it over my dead body. Remember Kepha or Peter. He sliced the guy's ear off in the in the garden. And, uh, and, and Yeshua, right there in front of everybody, put the ear back on. Healed yep. as though nothing ever happened. And so, you know, it was it was prophecy that, that had to be fulfilled. And he was willing to go through all of that for us. And I can't imagine it. I cannot imagine it. It just blows my mind. So through this, and thanks for asking that. I, I love when people have questions and oh, I wonder what this means. I love that. And if I don't know, I love finding out my doggone self. And that way I've learned. So and was, said, go ahead. So when he said that, when he had breakfast with disciples 
um, a week later when they saw him on the beach when they were out there fishing and they didn't recognize who he was. And he said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And they caught all the fish and came to shore. Was that... Um, was that what he was referencing? Because it doesn't. Uh, it looks like he was referencing the kingdom of God. So that's. I think that's where I was slightly confused. So yeah. So both things. It's both things on this. Is remember we look back. You know, for context, we look back, and we say, okay, uh, what what's happening here? What what exactly is happening here? Um, so we look back for context. What happened, and then what's happening. And then what he projected forward to be happening. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get together with you again. And um, in the kingdom, we'll, we'll go a little bit further. And there will be, let's see here. Let me go back one. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Right? The kingdom of right. God comes. When does that happen? When was that happening? The kingdom of God comes when he's resurrected from the dead. Okay. That's, that's what I was trying to clarify. That was exactly yeah. my question. Thank you for answering that. Oh, you bet. You bet. Love doing that. So throughout the centuries, various denominations and traditions, and look, let's not throw rocks, whatever your faith tradition is, whatever your denomination is. Let's not be wasting time throwing rocks at other people's uh, denominations and traditions. That's up to them to do. They make a choice. That's what they do. And we chose to do what, whatever ours are. Um, but they've developed different rituals and interpretations surrounding communion. But its fundamental significance is as a symbol of Christ's sacrifice and a means of spiritual communion with God. And that remains unchanged to this day. So today, we dig into the profound depths of fear and forgiveness and how they intertwine to bring us into true communion with our Creator. As we reflect on 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, that's the one I read from the Amplified. Let's open our hearts. Let's open our minds so that we can receive the divine wisdom that transcends mere words. Fear, it often is misunderstood only as a paralyzing emotion. But in its truest essence, it is a reverence and awe toward the Almighty God. People see fear. I fear God. Do you not fear God? And so it's been kind of misrepresented as, oh, you know, that type of thing. But, but it isn't that. It, it's in, this is why I say it, the original languages are critically important in order to understand because Hebrew and Aramaic are such phenomenal languages. They express things so much deeper. And if we mistranslate a little piece of it, we really miss a lot of it. So fear is an interesting word. It can have many different... Yes, there is fear. There is such a thing as fear of... Uh, you know, uh, fear and dread, but there's also fear um, in a holy way, looking at God as not an awesome God, but the awesome God. He's He is the holy God. He is the creator. And so we don't refer to him as the big guy. We don't refer to him as the man upstairs, you know, the big G. No, we don't do that at all. We, we have a fear, a respect, uh, a profound respect, for his power, his majesty, and his unfathomable love for us. I talked in my podcast uh, on Saturday, I think it was Saturday, um, Who is God? Remember, I did the series on True Word, Faith for Life, uh, Jesus Who, and I have more to do on that series. But I wanted to do one on Who is God? And so if you guys watch that, you'll see I talked about acknowledging, acknowledging with humility, submission, um, but but sort of a, a bold approach, approaching God with humility and submission, but standing up and recognizing, hey, I'm a child of the Creator. I'm a created being, and He is my God, and He is my King. And we have to acknowledge His sovereignty over our lives. Now, forgiveness. We don't like to talk about forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is not the funnest thing in the whole wide world to talk about. 
And it's really an act of releasing resentment and granting mercy, just as our Heavenly Father forgave us through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And remember, back in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 34, we read in the beginning, we're reminded of the ultimate act of forgiveness, the breaking of Christ's body and the shedding of His blood for the redemption of our sins. As unmerited recipients of this divine forgiveness, we're called to extend the same grace to others, thereby embodying the true spirit of communion with God. Now, that, that forgiveness thing isn't very easy, is it? This is not an easy thing, folks. To, to forgive is not easy. But he gave us countless examples of not only his forgiveness, but in several parables, uh, of about forgiving debt and then debt not being forgiven. Well, wait a second, you know, you were forgiven such a great debt and you don't forgive this over here. So many examples of forgiveness and it's such a critical and key thing to us getting along as the body of Christ. There are a lot of people who completely and utterly struggle to accept the notion of forgiveness. Throughout history, the observance of communion or the Lord's Supper, it's, it's been reduced to this ritualistic practice, devoid of its original and true meaning. We've approached the communion table with shallow hearts, right? Failing to grasp its significance in relationship with God and with one another. And you know, um, there are passages of scripture that talk about, look, if you have something against your brother, if you have a quarrel with your brother, if you're if if you're not getting along with your brother, a brother as an example, but um, your your fellow believers, if you have a quarrel with them or there's something not right between the two of you, it says put your tithe and offering down. And go to that person and resolve it. And then come back. You know it's so important, and in order to truly commune with God, we have to have a forgiving heart. It's, it's um, I don't know, I, I've been in churches where it truly felt like a sacred remembrance, a sacred moment of remembrance, reflection, and reconciliation, a tangible expression of our unity in Christ and our commitment to love as he, and really our commitment to love and forgive because love is not love without forgiveness. At just as he has loved and forgiven us, Look, we're, we're all just hungry beggars who are supposed to tell others where we found the bread of life. Look, I'm just going to tell you, forgiveness is one of the biggest things that people stumble with. They stumble yeah. and stumble and stumble. And I've been in that place. There have been people where I needed to forgive. And maybe, Chris, you're thinking of somebody that you needed to forgive or maybe you need to forgive. And, and before we take of the, the bread and the wine... We really have to think about it. God, it, you know, who have I failed to forgive? God, you know, my hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I'm, I'm struggling in this area. Please help me. Please forgive me on my sins. But here's the thing. And my pastor, who I dearly love as a brother, and that's my pastor, emphasized this on Sunday. He said, you've been redeemed. Uh, and actually, the worship pastor said it during the worship music. He stopped the scripture. He said, You've been redeemed. Hey, we got a quick question. Yeah, fire it up. Sorry, I, I hate. I feel bad for cutting no, no. you off. Otherwise, uh, I'll I'll miss the question. Um, in the chat, it said, "Explain John six fifty one." And in John six fifty one, it says, "I am the living bread which came down from heaven." If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. Okay. What's the question? Just uh, he, 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 yeah, he says explain um, oh. that. Oh, and, and uh, that's it, a great, it seems pretty self-explanatory, but um, I, I'd no, rather you I'm explain it because... It. Okay. Oh, yeah, because listen, so let's go back. It's funny, I was just saying this, and, and here we get, we get a live example uh, in chat of someone asking a very real, very good question about what does this mean that, you know, he refers to himself as the bread. And why? 
why does he res- like we think of bread like there's there's rolls dinner rolls which are great um there are croissants which are also great um there is sourdough bread which is also great um there is rye and pumpernickel and marble rye and there's you know you know what i say french bread already apparently i want french bread and <laughs> there yeah but you know what i'm saying there's all these different types of bread so we in this society think of it and and we view bread we have like we eat bread with a bunch of other things right when we have dinner we eat bread we eat bread sometimes you go to an italian restaurant you know they bring you bread first um and in bread and butter and maybe a little pesto and and um olive oil or whatever and so that's part of another meal a whole nother meal but in hebrew culture bread was the center point right so if you lived in a place where you could fish if you live close enough to uh where there were fish that you could catch you know you would have protein you would have fish but you would have wine yes it was real wine um and actually far more potent and pure than than what we have today but um wine in its crimson sense was it, it was aligned with Christ's blood and with blood they thought of it as that because of the color and the value you know wine was critically important if you didn't have wine you 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 would fall out you know you would be massively dehydrated so if you didn't have bread you'd die bread was the center point the main focal point of every meal and sometimes wine was the focal point it was the only thing and without bread and why else too bread kept so if you went on a journey you could wrap up some wine put it in your sack and off you go and you're going to have bread to eat along the way and of course what is it it's carbohydrates right which give you back then it didn't have the all the bad stuff in it right it was all natural completely organic and so it was healthful for us so when he speaks of himself as the bread, he is the bread of life because to Jews and and people of that region yeah, bread was life. If you didn't have bread, you were dead. No bread, you dead. But if you had bread, you had life. So that's what this is about there. Um and it's it's uh then the true bread, you know, he's the true bread. That means he's the authentic life. You can place your faith in him because he's authentic. There's nothing fake about him. He and the Father are real, and they're unpretentious. Um, one of the, the, the next teaching, go ahead. So, sorry, and there was a one more question with that question. It was on John four uh, fourteen, and it says, "Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst.'" But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And that was the last of that question, but it was a two-part question that for both of those verses. Well, what and, does, what's the question in that? Four, four, what, two, does it, what, what does it mean? Whoever drinks of the oh, water. Oh, now y'all are messing with me. Now y'all are messing <laughs> with me. I'm going to tell you why. Because you've now asked me a question about one of my very most favorite, favorite, favorite passages of Scripture in the whole Bible. Wow. I love this exchange. Number one, think about it. Why did this Samaritan woman, why would she be at the well in the Middle East at that month and that time of day? Noon? Oh, no. Nobody would be going to the well at noon. Why? Because it was about 127 degrees, literally. Yeah. It was the desert, y'all. It's hot. Is that when he asked her? Is that when he asked her to fill up his cup? But she said no because they were a different... um, She was a Samaritan. And he was a a, a A Jew Jew. or... Right, so... And that's when he told her... That's when he told her all her deepest, darkest secrets, and yep. she uh, she switched like a light switch. It's amazing. And you know, the Samaritans, people really throw rocks, the uninformed. Again, a shameless plug for learning the original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and then Greek, um, is because when you read this in Hebrew, 
it comes completely to life. And you realize also, if you learn about the land, the culture, the land of the people, and the people of the land, and the people of the book, right? This is what they were called. And so the Samaritans they were a different sort of people. They had some practices that were eh, a little bit sketchy. And so for him to just engage, first of all, it's one woman and one man. Are you kidding? A rabbi is going to be alone with a woman? At a well that's well outside of town? No. Yeah, that's a no-no. That's a no-no. Oh, no, it's such a no-no. Such a complete yeah. no-no. Um, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What is living water? Right? In the desert... In 127 degrees, you can't live long without water, right? If you had bread even, but you didn't have any water, you'd be like, right? You, you, your mouth would be so dry, your body would dry up very, very quickly. If you don't have water, if you don't have wine, you don't have life. There is no life right. with no water. And so this is, and this is why it's so important to learn the context the entire context of this exchange. It's one of the most beautiful exchanges ever. And what I love is she says, he explains it all to her. And then verse uh, 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. Come here or have to come here to draw water. Why? First of all, it's a long walk by herself. She could have been taken advantage of, beaten up, raped, murdered, any number of things. But she also was lonely, right? She didn't have friends because of all the rumors and the talk about her, you know, and she had no friends. She had no community. Yeah, she, she had lonely. like five husbands over time as yeah. well. She had very sinful. But... Yeah, I'm going to do a teaching on this to explain what each little thing means. It, it's super, super fun. Uh, but right. she, she says to him, give, you know, give me this, this water because I don't want to have to come here again. I don't want to be thirsty again. Now, here's the difference. Jesus, oh, y'all are going to make me preach. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Oh, now look here. Yeshua knew she didn't have a husband. He, he knew she wasn't her husband. Now, I explain in my message on this, understanding that it wasn't that she was a, some sort of prostitute. It wasn't that she was some sort of floozy. It was that because of certain circumstances, one of which could very well be that she could not provide her husband with a son. She couldn't bear a son. And so perhaps that's why she kept getting put out and put out and put out. And so anyway, so it says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, I perceive, sir, that you were a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, a term of endearment, not like woman. You know, like that, like we take it. But in its in its context, it was a term, a loving term. There are many different words for woman, woman in Hebrew and Aramaic. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. But when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ, which Hamashiach, Hamashiach, uh, means Messiah. And um, when He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, Oh, come on. I, who speak to you, am he here's the thing I, I love this part i love this part just then timing right timing 
Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they all went out of the town and were coming to him. Anyway, the, the part here is, what did she leave there? What did she leave, folks? She left her pot of water. She walked all the way out there for water. In the hot noonday, 127 degree sun. She carried that sucker out there. She filled it up and she left it there. And she was so excited. She was so filled. She was so relieved of thirst. Thirst. That she left it there. She didn't need it anymore. How amazing. Oh, man. More, and listen to this. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Look, folks, if you believe somehow or another, you've been told a story that I, I do a teaching on the Ezer Kenedgo. And, and that's all I'm going to tell you right now. The Ezer Kenedgo. This is the woman. This is a powerful woman. This is the wife. This is the love. She, she really holds so much more power in this culture than you can possibly imagine. And so uh, I want you to think about how many times women, women's testimony was not accepted in a court of law. There were many different parameters. You had to have two witnesses. They'd be male. All these different things. There was all this different stuff, which I teach about. And, uh, and here it is, uh, yet another woman. He, right? He, who did he appear to? Resurrected. Women. I mean, come on. Who, who did he do the first public miracle for? A woman, his mother, so that another woman wouldn't be embarrassed. I mean, why? Ask yourself why. Uh, if women were so diminutive and so uh, underappreciated, why is Yeshua, Jesus, why is he allowing women to have such a central role? Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did, so that when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that what we believe, uh, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I didn't even mean to preach on that, but y'all ask, y'all mess around and ask me about Samaritan woman. Woo, one of my faves, one of my favorites. So, pivotal, pivotal in all of history she was, and she is. So that's that's the answer to that. The, the water, it's um, it, it has a another meaning. And in that culture, a critical meaning. And really in this culture, we can't live without water. We say, wow, we got so long as I have Diet Coke. I'll be, you know, oh, Diet Coke is killing you, y'all. It's killing all of us. Don't sue me, Coca-Cola. I don't have any money. Um, I'm just saying in general, sugary drinks, not good for us. Sugar in general, not good for us. It's not good for us. Um, that said, the, the point is, is you need water. Water, good, clean water. And we need the water of life. And we need the bread of life. Speaking of the bread and speaking of wine and all of that, did you know that you, I, I think I said this, you don't need a pastor, you don't need a church to observe communion. You don't need either one. All you need is bread, juice of your choice, Jesus our Redeemer, and you. Oh wait, I forgot one other thing, a repentant heart. So next time you do communion, wherever it is, wherever you partake in it, Let's really examine ourselves before partaking in communion next time. Let's discern the body of Christ, not only in the, the bread and the cup, but also in the community of believers gathered around us. Let's repent of our sin and forgive those who have wronged us and embrace the transformative power of God's love. Look, as we partake in the bread next time, let's remember Christ's broken body that he willingly offered for our salvation. As we drink from the cup next time, let's remember his precious blood 
poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we leave this place of reverence, wherever it is, wherever your church is, wherever your living room is, wherever your dining room is, wherever it is that you do communion, carry the spirit of fear and forgiveness with us, walking in obedience to God's commandments and bearing witness to his redeeming love. You say, why do I carry fear and forgiveness? I get what, why the fear? Remember what I said about fear. We've, we've made fear be something that it's not. Doesn't have to be. Fear as in reverence of God and forgiveness. We can't love God without having a forgiving heart. We walk in obedience to God's commandments and we bear witness to his redeeming love. Now, may fear and forgiveness guide our hearts. May true communion with God be our constant desire and our every day, every moment pursuit. Amen and shalom. Christopher, that's what I have for today. They got a bunch of extra because somebody messed around and asked a question about the Samaritan woman, which y'all ought to know me by now. You get me fired up on that, and I can't stop myself. So uh, if we went long, that's the dude's fault or the lady's fault who messed around and asked me about the Samaritan woman. Oh, now I love I'm hearing it. Oh, you can you can preach about it for for uh, to the cows come home, and I, I think everybody in the chat would agree as well that uh, no one's complaining that you're preaching. But everybody wow. that's in the chat, please make sure you guys hit the like button. Um, it helps spread the the gospel and the word and the algorithm promotes the video more. And as our community grows, so does. Um, Dr. Greener's community because he is under our, our under our umbrella. So uh, everything, all the viewers and the community that grows ends up watching his stuff as well, which reminds me to remind you guys what I said at the beginning of the show that starting today, I have a new contest that I'm running for 30 days. The contest will result in one person getting a humble lamb Bible. Uh, humble lamb is humble lamb is sending me their new edition. Um, their new Lion uh, revised edition, which is really awesome. Um, but I don't need it. I have enough. So the, the contest is simple. Whoever uh, refers the most amount of new members to our social media site wins the Bible at the end of the 30 days. It's as simple as that. Um, That's a huge prize. Yeah, I mean, That's and a it's huge super easy. Prize, it's super easy too. the social media sites a no brainer. If, if you are someone that uh, wants to be a part of the body of Christ, even if you're a newcomer, this is the place where our community gathers. It's a uh, uncensored, you know, you can be yourself without being worried about uh, being censored by the platform or tracked by the government. This is, this is our private place that our community gathers in. So the contest is simple. Um, the one who refers the most members, um, new members, you know, wins the Bible at the end of the month. So I'm putting that into effect today. And on May 8th, I will announce the winner. So hopefully you guys awesome. enjoy that. And it'll be easy to track because um, I'm going to ask, um, you know, I always welcome every new member with an email and ask them where, uh, how they heard about us and stuff like that. And plus you guys, when you're on the social site, you see the new members show up in the feed because they create their profile and stuff like that. So I'm excited. And uh, Sean, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, heartfelt uh, teaching. I always look forward to your teachings, and I know everybody in the audience does as well. It's it's always a very very special time for us. Well, the blessing is mine, and I love uh, you know the True Word Faith for Life uh, family is growing as an offshoot of the of Two Witnesses Live, and I appreciate all of the people that join us over there, and and um, I love the comments. The comments are so sweet. We've, we've had really a, a neat engagement there. And I can't see the comments during the live here when I'm here on here on Mondays. But when I broadcast, um, you know, from, from my site, I can see them. And I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's, it's, it's not divisive. 
It's it's not unkind. It's not uh, picayune, you know, religious Rottweilers. Uh, it's not people trying to show off their knowledge. It's just good people coming together and hearing the word and learning to practice it and other the other stuff that I teach about. And same way here. It's it's fun. It's fun to come here. That's the point yeah. of it is it's fun to come here. And um, I'm excited about the um, the humble lamb promotion. I think that is exciting. That is an exceptional Bible. I'm I, a dear listener. Uh, I can't even imagine sent me one. Um, Did you already get it? I don't I don't have it yet. I don't know how long it takes. So, yeah, um, yeah he, he sent me or he purchased one. And however long it takes, I don't know. But um, it, it should be so any day excited. now. It should be any day now because uh, he awesome. confirmed the order, and um, I followed up with the the owner to make sure that they had the address right. And awesome. Um, but I mean, if anyone deserves one, it's you, my friend. Uh, but I deserve? I don't deserve anything. I deserve but, a beating. Is what I deserve. <laughs> well, I think you've already received plenty of those over the years. <laughs> I have been I have been beat up a little bit, so literally and yeah. figuratively. Well, thank you for having me on. Thank you everybody that listens um, and shares and 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 all the comments. Um, love it, love it, love it, and uh, may God bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you. Yeah, and we watchful and I, I believe, plan to go live uh, later this afternoon to talk about whatever happens with this um, the shenanigans. So, um, I'm going to head into work now and then I'll try to knock out what I need to knock out there and then, uh, be back in a few hours so we could go live, but I'll update everybody on our social platform. But thank you so much, everybody for coming and spending time with us. This is our personal ecclesia. This is our, this is our church. It doesn't have to be in a large building with hundreds of people. Matter of fact, when Jesus was, doing his teachings it was in people's homes just a few people mm -hmm. so that was the and it was original. called the kehala the kehala in hebrew the kehala which is uh represented a religious gathering was it um, uh, a gathering is that of faith. the same is that the same as ecclesia no ecclesia is greek and ecclesia is um refers it's a it's a secular expression but some of the translators they didn't figure out what word they didn't know hebrew so they said well what word could we use for the gathering and they knew because they they knew greek they said well the closest thing is ecclesia um and so they used that but but okay. uh kehala kehala k-e-h-i-l-l-a kehala uh, Kehala is is represents what what the gathering actually was well thank you so much for your wisdom uh, and We'll see you guys later this afternoon. I'll update everybody then, but everybody have a wonderful day and goodbye for now. God bless you.